So I mislabeled this title. I do a few R talks, and this is not that talk. We're doing like an intro one, not a data manipulation one. Um, I like to kind of ask, how many people have ever written code in R before? We have a few people. OK, have you ever done a project in R? How many have actually like really done R? OK, we still got more coming in. That's OK, because I got slides like, you know, everybody has to do the who the hell are you slide, who the heck are you slide. Um, I forgot this being videotaped. I'll be on best behavior. Um, so I'm David Crook. I'm a Microsoft developer evangelist. I focus on machine learning and embedded technologies. I get out of that zone a little bit, but that's kind of like where I like to live. And if I can stay there, that would be fantastic. I uh, spent a lot of my time prototyping, hacking, inventing, uh, started a couple businesses. I'm just generally a nerd for code. Um, not like other nerds. I don't know anything about Star Trek, but I know a whole lot about code. Um, and then I'm also a husband, a father, and I really like jujitsu. That's like my favorite hobby. Uh, you can reach me via email at dacrook at microsoft.com or Twitter, data for bots or dacrook.com. Now that's like my little micro blog. So like if I ever encounter something I find rather difficult or challenging, I'll throw a quick little article up there to, so I never have to solve that problem again. You can go there and find problems that I didn't like solving. That way you don't have to do it. Uh, I always have to throw some sort of like uh, slide in here about overheady stuff. Like, you know, everybody goes and does a talk and wants to push some initiative. So I've got one slide and I promise that's it. Uh, so there's this early adopters, POCs, I'm calling it the program. Um, you know, every now and again we come up with these programs and stuff, but basically um, we're looking for people who are doing really cool stuff with our technology and you get free engineers to work on it if it makes it through the whole process. And I can explain what the process is, uh, it's just not, you know, I could, it takes a while to explain it. So uh, shoot me an email, dacrook at microsoft.com if you have anything on machine learning, cognitive services, uh, open source on Azure, anything like that. Uh, and there's potential to get free help uh, with a bunch of caveats and we'll ex I'll explain that later. Uh, kind of community assistance, some of the things that we're also pushing are uh, helping the community just grow and be thriving in a good ecosystem. So like myself and Amanda are out here. Uh, she's also an evangelist. Um, just generally trying to make sure that there, there's a good community and support as much as we can. So if you have a community that is in need of assistance, let us know and we'll see what we can do for you. Uh, no promises as usual. Uh, and then also in downtown Miami, we have this thing called an Innovation Center. Uh, how many of you are from Miami? We've got like two from Miami. So this is only applicable to like 2% of the audience. So that's useful, but uh, I do office hours on Fridays. My buddy Joe does office hours on Tuesdays, basically two Microsoft engineers to give you free help on whatever it is. If you want your tax returns done, we'll help you do your tax returns because that's important too. Um, Preferably, we'd like you to come in with, hey, my web server crashed and I have no idea what's going on, or like, can you help me with this algorithm? But you know, if you've got tax problems, you, know, you can't have a successful business using our technology if you can't do your taxes, so you know, whatever helps. Uh, we got a bunch of hardware down there, so we got Raspberry Pis, Arduinos, 3D printers. It prints big stuff. I was trying to print the Millennium Falcon, but it broke halfway through, so now it's kind of like a cool thing that I want to like do this to my laptop with. <laughs> uh, so that's kind of neat. We also have meeting space, and everything that our team does is more or less free. I don't know of anything that we do that's not free, but you know, beware that it might not necessarily be free. I just think it's all free, but you know, with beware, I don't necessarily know everything. So uh, today, there's some sample data uh, that we're going to use. Nobody brought their laptops and didn't read that this is a hands-on session, so I am changing the entire talk right now to not be hands-on, uh, and I'm just going to show you a bunch of code and step through it and explain what it's doing, why it's doing it, so forth and so on. Um, this is all the jail bookings from Miami up to uh, like two days ago. So like last Thursday, I think, was the last time they updated it. Grabbed all the data, and we're just going to see what social problems is Miami facing and uh, kind of plot that all out. This is something that good is, R is really good for. Brings me to the next part. What in the world is R good for? Why would you learn R? What's the point of R? You know, Microsoft is pushing this R thing. They've stuck it in SQL Server. You can get it on Batch. You know, variety of server-side technologies. What do you do with it? Um, I find, uh, I personally think it's one of the best in class for data prep and manipulation. 
uh, ETL visualization, data pipelining and processing. It fits onto a lot of server technologies fairly easily. And uh, you'll see um, kind of what syntactically how it works and how it deals with things. It's kind of F sharp ish. So if some folks know F sharp, it's kind of F sharp ish. Not, not exactly, F sharp usually doesn't crash as much, but um, you know, the, you get advantages and disadvantages. The advantage to R is it'll handle everything super easy with very little code. Sometimes it crashes on you, so uh, you know, beware. Uh, where can I deploy R? This is a really good question because a lot of people will go in and start learning R. I started learning R and didn't really think about this question and it turns out that you know the sec first thing I do is machine learning, the second thing I do is embedded technologies. Turns out that R doesn't run on embedded systems very well. It takes a lot of hacking to make that happen. Uh, so this is just some high level where you might want to stick R uh, most easily into third party server ecosystems which you know, hopefully you guys know what that means. The, High level, uh, basically R has a licensing model that is not very nice. So you have to run it through some third party execution engine and loosely couple your code with R code. Hence things like R.NET, it stands up its own little execution environment and you kind of run between those. So when you install something like R.NET, you have to install R and R.NET. You're not allowed to package those together per the licensing model. So that makes it much easier to stick in a third party server ecosystem, something like a SQL Server 2016 or a Spark or something like that. Uh, workstation work where I'm trying to do uh, some basic experimentation and figuring out what I want to do and then run it onto something uh, as a batch processing after that. So maybe I've got terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of data that I need to crunch through. I'll probably do some of that work, bring down like a couple gig on my box, see how it goes, toss it up into a batch processing ecosystem and kind of cross my fingers and pray. Um, there's a lot of that. Uh, possible on client, like I was saying, something like an F -sharp type provider, for example, beware that you also have to ship down all the R packages separately from that. Um, and if you don't, you get to open source your whole product. So that's always fun. What are we going to do today is that we're going to build an interactive uh, visualization that ships as HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript. We're going to code everything in R. And uh, that's kind of the end result. You can click on things and see trends and stuff. And uh, you can integrate it into, I've got it live on my WordPress site right now. You can stick it on a phone. You can, it's HTML5, JavaScript, and CSS at the end of the day. So, uh, you know, wherever you can put that, you can put this, uh, which is fantastic. So we're going to grab some real data uh, because everybody does demos with fake data. Sometimes they use real data. I think it kind of showcases the real power of R if you grab like government data. Has anyone dealt with government data before? It's absolutely atrocious um, is kind of what I figured out. Uh, so it really helps you see what the power of R is, uh, get it into a format for charting, and then draw a modern chart that can be integrated into whatever platform. That should be pretty simple. I shouldn't ask if there's questions yet. Uh, and then before we get into it, talk a little bit about tooling. Dev environments. Uh, you get more or less two different options unless you're like a notepad plus plus and throw it into the R GUI kind of person, which I like having an environment. Uh, R Studio is kind of my preferred um, because I don't really do much C sharp coding anymore, so I don't need Visual Studio as much. I usually just use the compiler now. Uh, so R Studio is kind of like its own standalone thing, runs on everything. And then Visual Studio 2015 with R tools for VS, if you're planning on deploying to like a SQL Server 2016, that might be kind of useful because you get all your tooling into one nice little package. So those are the two. Uh, dev environments that I use and kind of know of. There's probably more. Those are the two I use. Lastly, uh, before we get into actual code, is some package talk. This is probably going to be your bread and butter uh, package. This is probably one of the most common packages out there. It's dplyr. Um, it extends the plyr package. I don't know what the D stands for. Um, I don't even know what the ply stands for, but the R stands for R. Uh, <laughs> so at least I got, what is that, 20% of the acronym correct, so that's not bad. Um, so basically it's a data manipulation package. It has a lot of uh, functional 
high-level um, functions, I guess, to it uh, that really enable you to be very effective and quick with your data manipulation. But I'll just demonstrate it, but the nice things are that it's implemented in C++ and it's functional from the ground up, so it makes your code look really neat and concise. Uh, some of the functions it has, select, mutate, filter, arrange, group, and summarize. Those are kind of your primary verbs for doing whatever manipulation, and within a combination of those verbs, you can more or less do anything that you want. Um, and I got a great demo on that. Then this is the other one that I really like to use. I use the heck out of this thing. This is basically for, I started as an F-sharp developer, so I have a lot of like F-sharp references. This is like the F-sharp pipe operator. Uh, so it's this funny looking thing and it really helps clean up your code so you can remove the left hand side of your code and you're just piping things around and I really like that style of code. That's my second favorite uh, package and this works really well with the dplyr package because they were kind of built together and uh, you should really use them together. So all of that said are there any questions before we hop into code? There's no questions at all. High level, there's like, yeah. Oh, you want to see the CSV? Oh, you want to see the link? Okay. It's this one here. I'm actually going to try and pull it live and see what happens. If it doesn't, I still have it in my. Um, in my environment and uh, we'll be able to go from there. But this is one of the things that I really like. I'll talk a little bit more about this explicitly. But basically I took the, I downloaded the CSV and stuck it into Azure blob storage and I just took it like it was on the government website. So there's no extra manipulation. You just export a CSV and there you go. You've got, you've got data in whatever format it came from the government and now it's our job to take that and transform it into something that you can maybe make a case for who knows what. So this would kind of be like the Miami uh, Police Department comes, they hire you for like a couple of hours and say, what can you do for us? It would be really great to be able to very quickly showcase, I can do some really cool visualizations, maybe we can find a trend in something and let's do a bigger engagement. So this would be something that you might do as a first off uh, to just demonstrate your value very quickly. Uh, that's one of the things I actually really like R4 is demonstrating value very quickly or like a new data set comes in and I'm like, I don't know what to do with it. Let's pop it in here and do a little bit of exploration. Did you get the URL? I did. It's not working? Okay. That's actually interesting. I've never actually tried to do it non-case sensitive, so. Um, hopefully you guys can keep up. There ten, and it, when, I found, when I decided that probably was gonna be not very many people coming, I decided to add a lot more code. Um, so we're gonna go through and I was gonna try and explain things. Uh, there's a Slack channel. So uh, like, who's from Florida? Raise your hand if you're actually from Florida. All right, so I started a Slack channel for Florida data developers. So like, you can just hop on there and just get help about whatever, just help each other out, you know, pose questions. I stood up a GPU cluster the other day and this other dude just happens to like do a lot of GPU computing and uh, he was pretty crucial in helping me through that and then vice versa, you just share. Um, anyways, so one of the first things that you gotta do is get your packages. So there's this install.packages and you have to use the quotes. I don't know why you have to use the quotes. I see a lot of demos where people don't use the quotes. That doesn't actually work. This gets into some of the parts where like, you know, you see some demos on R and it doesn't always work the way that it looks like it's gonna work. The other thing is it says packages plural, which implies that you can install multiple packages. I've seen demos where people do multiple packages. It doesn't work on my box. I have no idea why it doesn't work on my box. It doesn't do that, so because it doesn't do that on most boxes I've encountered, I've just come across doing it like this and just separating out all the dependencies, kind of like using statements. These install.packages is a one-off installation. After you're done with this, you can just delete the, the code. And I knew I was going to do this, so I wrote a comment that says, don't forget to show RStudio a bit. 
So this is your environment. Uh, the R tools for Visual Studio will basically reconfigure your entire Visual Studio to look a lot like this. And um, what you get is over here on the right is a data tab. This is data that's currently in your environment. R is very much a uh, scripting with an environment kind of ecosystem. So when you run code, that code is now in that environment. And this is the representation of data that you have in that global environment. It's going to contain things like your data frames, your functions, uh, various other things like that. You can also dive into the functions and data that is contained within packages that you currently have loaded. Um, you can also clean it all out. You can import data sets manually by clicking this from a web URL or a local file like a CSV. It'll load it in as a variable name and you can start actually consuming it that way. On the bottom, it'll show you what packages you currently have um, and then various plots and files on your file systems. On the very bottom left is your console. So I mostly spend my time in, uh, I use all three windows, but basically your scripting and authoring environment, you'll execute it and see output as well as errors here. If you need to dive in and try and debug something that you want to see why the heck is it giving me this kind of output, what's going on with this data stuff, look up there and you can dive into your variables and then lots of plots come out here. So for example, if we wanted to dive into the uh, corrections data, we can get some form of insight here and see, okay, this is what we have. These are the columns. We've got book dates, defendants, date of births. Uh, levels is kind of like the number of categories. So that's a data frame concept. Um, so basically when you bring in a piece of data, there may be a hundred thousand uh, rows in that data, but in, within one of those columns, there might only be four unique values. What this is honing in on is like location. There's 56,844 unique values in this particular data set. So um, some of the nice things are when you're starting to think about things like machine learning problems, it's useful to see what these are and you also need to format them to be the correct type. So a factor is going to be processed as a categorical type. So if you have something that's like 56,844, you don't necessarily want that to go into your algorithm as a categorical type because it's going to do a lot of extra work to try and deal with that. And it's going to blow your data set size. Um, well, it depends on what type it is. So if it's strings, it'll probably go down. Um, so that's high level on our studio. The next thing that we'll do is load libraries. So there's actually a uh, particular order that you need to load these libraries in. Um, the only one that really matters is this plyr and this dplyr. And that's why I think like dplyr, the d probably just stands for darn it, I fixed it. Uh, because plyr has some broken functions in it. And uh, dplyr basically just overwrites those functions. So if you uh, load dplyr first and then plyr, your code will probably break. If you load plyr first and then dplyr, your code will hopefully work fairly well. And I'll uh, try to point out if I can remember which section of code it was. I encountered it and was like, I'm never ever doing that again. Um, so those are the libraries. So when you actually want to do this, you can highlight whole sections of code. And uh, we'll go to Windows minus. And you can hold Control Enter. And it'll actually go and load all the Oh, an object is messed. OK, so yeah, red doesn't necessarily mean bad. Red sometimes means, hey, I'm overwriting some stuff. Beware, I overrode some stuff. So remember how I said dplyr overwrites some stuff from plyr? The red's just saying, beware of that. So you can highlight whole sections of code, control enter. Now it's into our environment. Um, I have Wi-Fi, so I'm going to go ahead and do something risky. Yes, we're going to clean that. And actually, we're going to do, we're going to restart everything so we're completely from scratch. Oh, other thing to note, this blast slash laypack library is detected. That means I also have the math kernel libraries installed. It accelerates anything that's numerical computing uh, by using those libraries instead of the out of the box. So if you're going to install this, I highly recommend using the Microsoft R open flavor and the math kernel libraries. Uh, and you install them first, the R uh, open, 
and then the math kernel libraries. Uh, it just makes stuff go from like taking five minutes down to like 30 seconds, depending on what you're, what you're doing, of course. So we load some of this in. We don't actually need that code. So this, in my opinion, is one of the neatest things that you can do is, so I'm going to create this variable. And uh, read.csv comes from, I forgot which package that came from. I think that was just out of the box R. And I'm pointing it to a remote blob store with some ambiguous CSV. So what's interesting is, let's just go ahead and run this thing and see what happens. So it's going to take a second to load because there's some, I'm not sure how many rows, but we'll find out how many rows there are. I'm going to cross my fingers that the uh, Wi-Fi is not going to take too terribly long. It's a large file. While that's loading and downloading, are there any questions of any kind? Because it's going to take a, I think I might have underestimated how long that was going to take. <laughs> yes. Um, have you tried the F sharp to R type writer? I did. Um, and, and I've used like, so I'm, right now I'm spending a lot of my time in F sharp, Python, and uh, C++. The only issue that I take with it is now I have to know something else. And I'm one guy, and I want to know as little things as possible and still be effective and get my job done. Um, so when I was finding that I was doing, like, now I've got C sharp, F sharp, R, Python, SQL, I was like, dude, my brain's not big enough for that. I need to cut, like, three things out. So um, I ended up cutting out everything except for R, Python, and C++, just because of the type of work that I'm doing these days. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, that's just what it is. I kind of wish that they would bring some of the f -sharp features into uh, some of the other things, like discriminated unions would be really awesome to have. Multi-line lambdas would be really awesome to have. Type providers would be awesome to have. But uh, you know, it's kind of like how JavaScript won out. Uh, nobody wanted to use JavaScript, but everybody was using it. So it became the big popular thing to do. Oh, dear. Um, actually, I have this on this system, so let's just go ahead and uh, you can't do live demos without encountering some sort of problem. So what we're going to do is usually I have a data file, canned demos, that sounds like it would be it, nope. If you want Hillary Clinton's emails, I can send those to you. <laughs> It was a really interesting, uh, really interesting exploration. I decided that that was not suitable for public consumption. Um, shoot, I didn't put it on this box. Well, this is going to be a really lame talk if I uh, let's do this. Um, you'll get to see some of my other tools, I guess. So, has anyone used this Azure Storage Explorer thing before? This is like the best thing since sliced bread. Um, basically, you just upload data and right click generate keys. Um, this is probably another one of my most common tools in my toolbox. You're not using the new one? I didn't know there was a new one. I've just been using this one for a while. There's a cross platform one at storageexplorer.com. Oh, that'll be nice because I'm spending a lot of my time on uh, Linux now. I don't know if this works on Linux. Jesus Christ, what's happening? Uh-oh, this is going to be bad. Data contest, data.zip. This isn't, it's got to be this one, DRC data. Oops. Here's what we're going to do. No. Uh-oh, if you want to quit. Welcome to some of the uh, benefits of using R. I really like it, but there are some times where I just really want to do terrible things to it. The nice thing is you can save your work, your, uh, your, works, your work environment. So, OK, forget that. We're not going to download it. I saved my workspace earlier because I figured something like this might happen. So one of the nice things is you can save your workspace and recover for demos or whatever other case may be and ship that workspace around. You can load it into Azure Storage Explorer if you really wanted to and ship that around. So 
Okay, it has some downsides as far as some of the stuff that happens, but at least they knew that it had some downsides. It's a tool made by statisticians, not by developers. Be aware. This is one of the reasons that I still use something like a Python or, an, well, now I use mostly Python as my kind of primary language for production systems. Okay, so what this really does, uh, since I already loaded it, summary correct, uh, corrections in it, is that you get a really nice format on what your data is going to look like. So with one line of code, you get some really awesome output. So for example, um, for date of birth, we have 38 instances of people being born on August 8th, August 31st, 1982. We can see that Jose Medina has been booked 30 times. And Rodolfo Hernandez has been booked 18 times. We also have things like bench warrants and resisting officers without violence. All sorts of interesting things that you can get with a single line of code after having loaded some random data set that is in a terrible format. So uh, even though from like a production standpoint, I'm, I'm kind of hesitant pushing this into like a live environment, that's why I like it more for batch processing. Um, you get some of these insights very quickly. The next thing is uh, this kind of table DF. So this is an example of using the MagRitter package. Um, take the left-hand side, pump it as the parameter. Yes? Does, does, is this requiring a fairly normalized format, it looks like? Um, you can, it'll consume whatever you want to throw in it, and then it's going to do who knows what, and then it's up to you at that point. But a lot of the times, like say you have a, uh, like a, it'll, it'll present it to you in a normalized, whatever format it is in a tabular-ish structure is going to fit it into that tabular-ish structure. Uh, it, it isn't going to typically go and uh, spread everything back out for you or compress everything back together. It's going to just give you a view on what it is, and it's up to you to kind of do the next step. So is there an actual like, pre-processing or relationship that it's figuring out here, or is it that just the format and it's the, the date colon counts and it's already aggregated in that CSV? This is, it's actually doing some processing. So when I run this summary line of code, it goes and does all of that for you and does all the counting. And uh, if you have a numerical value, let's see if there's a numerical value, it'll give you things like the standard deviation for columns and the, uh, the quartiles, all sorts of kind of nice statistical things. Um, and it's going, that's what the summary uh, function primarily does. Windows minus. So, okay, so we've got this corrections in it. We can do the summaries. The next kind of thing that we're going to do is uh, we're going to take a look at what the top 10 charges are. So no semicolons or anything like that. Grab the, uh, set the num charges variable. We're just going to focus on the top 10. Otherwise, our uh, graphic at the very end is going to be horrendous. This is kind of an example of using the Lubridate package. Uh, it handles things pretty well. Uh, basically, you give it a date and a format using fairly standard, um, like month, day, year, and how it's going to be. So the slashes, this one actually has the month, the day, and the year with the slashes in between. You can define whatever syntax in between it. It's kind of reg regex-ish, um, but a little bit simpler than regex. And it's going to go and transform that into a date for you that you can now do things like extract the year, extract the month, do seasonality patterns. So um, that's probably one of the next most important things if you want to do in a seasonality analysis is make sure that you get your dates from a string format into the Lubridate's date format uh, because it works really well with a lot of the um, kind of prediction algorithms that ship with R. Uh, so we go ahead and do that as well. And then this big long thing here is one of the first, one of the kind of interesting renaming kind of things. So when you bring in a data set, you're like, what in the world is some of these things? So we've got things like cannabis trafficking 2,000 pounds, cannabis possession, we've got uh, cannabis possession, cocaine possession. And uh, when we looked at the initial chart, there's like, 
100,000, 50,000 of these different kinds of things. So if I want to do some form of analysis, it might behoove me to try and talk to the, my actual customer and say, hey, what do you actually care about? Do you care about drug trafficking? Is drug trafficking different from drug possession? So we'll go through and like cannabis possession, cocaine possession are going to get transformed into just straight out drug possession. And then coke selling and coke um, selling and delivery uh, is all drug trafficking. And then grand theft second and third degree are all still just grand theft. So um, one of the things I kind of like about this is that you can define a table that allows you to transform back and forth between um, either the left side or the right side. So if you want to take your data and then move it into this new format, it's very easy to do this. And then if at a later date you want to take the, what you have and then move it back, it's possible to do that as well. And that is all facilitated. Uh, this is where the magic ply R package comes in. This is the only thing I actually use ply R for. So there's a ton of this stuff. One of my buddies is an FBI agent in narcotics. So, oh shoot. So he, uh, he really helped, um, helped make this happen. So we're going to go through and actually execute all of this code. So control enter. So what we've done now is just create a lookup table and then the ply r package has this revalue. So it'll go through and revalue from the left side to the right side and you can revalue again from the right side back to the left side. So we're going to take this and this dollar sign is the syntax is kind of like your dot property in like C sharp. So we're going to take this charge one off of the data frame. So this is basically a table. It's kind of set up very well for dealing with tables and table manipulation. We're going to take the charge one and set it equal to the charge one piped into this revalue. And you just can do the inverse of that as well. Uh, the data has changed, of course, because it comes from the government. Uh, not present in X. That's okay because I'm pretty sure if we do summary at this point, so one of the nice things about this is corrections. We can go and look at charge one. So we have drug possession, theft, driver's license, and disorderly in public. So those are things that I came up with. So it's actually working. There's just a bunch of extra new stuff that got added since I wrote this code. Go figure. Welcome to government data. Um, so we can you know, just delete that line again. So this is getting into a little bit more of the um, kind of the magic of what R can do. Uh, coming from an F sharp background, this was really natural for me. So um, basically, we're just going to create this pipe, and it's taking whatever the output of the next function is and putting it into the next one. So for example, we're going to start with the corrections, and we're going to pipe that into filter. And we're going to make sure that we get rid of everything that has empty values for uh, charge one. Then the next thing that we're going to do is filter out anything that has miscellaneous warrants. It turns out that there's so many miscellaneous warrants being pro uh, done by uh, Miami that it skews the chart like absolutely horribly. And um, everything else is like this big and warrants is like this big. So it's kind of hard to get a view. I was like, okay, well that's our number one problem. We'll talk about that separately. Let's find out what else is going on. So then we can do something like grouping by what the charge is. So this is going to find all like charges, miscellaneous, warrants, uh, battery, so forth and so on, and then kind of create a abstract view of each of those in their own little groups. And then this in basically counts how many of those there are within each group. And that in is actually the function from dplyr that overwrites the ply R. So this is the line of code that breaks if you load those in the wrong order. Um, then what we do is we grab what are the top charges. So we want to know using num charges and the total uh, charge. So num charges is the 10. And then we're going to find the top 10 based on the count in num charge 1 and then arrange it by descending order. So what the goal of this is, is this is going to create a nice sorted uh, legend for us. So the legend in the chart that we saw, I wanted to make it a little bit more useful by showing, okay, battery is number one, then driver's license issues is number two, 
and by having a um, having the actual features in order allows me to create a chart like that. So we'll go ahead and just execute those lines of code. And in fact, if we want to see what the top ones are, we can do uh, we can just type top charges, and we can see that in the city of Miami, these are the top ten issues facing Miami to date. So the number one issue is battery with 7,690 occurrences of battery. By the way, this data set only goes to about halfway through last year. So this is less than one year of data and we have 7,690 occurrences of people actually being put in jail for battery. That's not just the number of occurrences, that's how many people are actually put in jail for it. With drug possession at 6,929, 6 it's very interesting to see some of this stuff. Um, and then if you, what, what it allows you to do at this point is you can actually go and take that table that we built earlier and do the inverse of it. So maybe when you're showing your customer, hey, it looks like the number one issue that you have is battery. What kinds of battery is it? It's actually domestic abuse. So now you know you have a domestic abuse problem in your city. Uh, and it creates this ability to go and actually do something about it. Um, this is some more of kind of the same type of thing, but we're getting the data together and ready for actual display at this point. So the way that the next package works, you kind of have to store something on the left-hand side. You can't just pipe it into the visualization package, which would be nice, but oh well. Um, so we're going to do this mutate thing, which adds additional uh, columns to uh, your actual data set. So we're going to take the corrections data and add a book year and a book month. This is going to allow us to have really nice labels and legends and things like that by actually extracting the year. So remember when I said we had that Luber date package, we really wanted to transform it into this date format. Am I on time? I'm probably running over. No, I've got like 20 minutes. Okay, cool. So it really makes it easy to extract the year. And then one of the neat, other neat things is this ordered months book date. That's all part of the uh, Lubridate package. Uh, basically, this ordered thing allows you to extract information a, a, in a specific order. And Lubridate behind the scenes will organize your months in accordance to the way the months are actually organized, but present them like January, February, so forth and so on. Whereas normally that's actually a fairly complex problem to solve because ordering of dates, January is not like alphabetically before February. Um, and then if you create them as one, two, three, four, now you have to have a mapping between your ordering and your actual display values. This just does all that like magic for you, which is really nice. And then again, we just ditch the charge one and uh, anything that's empty, miscellaneous warrants. Um, then what I really wanted to do was try and show seasonality. If Is there seasonality? That was kind of a question. I thought there's a lot of tourists in Miami. And uh, when we looked at the top 10 problems, there's like disorderly in public and drug possession, driver's licensing and drug trafficking. I was like, huh, lots of tourists, beach. There could be seasonality to these things. Um, because tourists might just want to come in and do drugs on the beach. That was my thought. Um, so it didn't occur, I didn't think about, oh, there's a giant port here. Maybe they're just shipping it in in containers and getting caught. But I was thinking more about, I don't like the tourists. I live on the beach and like, they're always there. I can't get rid of them. <laughs> um, Anyway, so what we want to do is group by first the year, then the month, then the chart. So this basically gives us a nice view of by year, by month, how many of these actually are occurring so we can see that breakdown. Do we actually get an increase in the middle of tourist season? Does it drop off outside of tourist season? If it doesn't, at least now we know it doesn't. And then uh, I do the summarize and take the number of observations and divide by a thousand because uh, this is the more professional looking graphic. If you have the thousand, it overruns with the, uh, with the actual data itself. So it's good to get your graphics into a nice format. And then add everything up into the total. And finally, th this, this is probably one of my favorite and other, other lines for data manipulation, is we want to find, 
we have this charge one and we have this top charges. So in, remember how we wanted to find just the top charges and really zero in on that? So what this is saying is inside of charge one, which is in the full data set, let's only find the top charges. Uh, so this filters the entire set down to only instances that are contained within the top 10 charges that we found. And that's another really nice, quick kind of data munging task to do. Um, a lot of other instances I found is that can be a little bit difficult. So if we go ahead and run all that, what we'll get, and I, like, I love this for debugging, is summary D, is that we get a data set that looks a lot like this. So in 2015, disorderly and public the total was uh, 381 occurrences of disorderly in public for just May of 2015. And then uh, June of 2015, drug possession, and it, it's going in the order that you've grouped by. So you'll notice that we did group by uh, year then month. We'll go 2015, 2016, and then in order the actual months because we used that nice order function. Create a stacked, ah, okay. So this, there are two plotting packages that I like to use. Uh, how many of you use Power BI or SSRS? Okay, so the first one is the one that will be compatible with Power BI and SSRS. That is ggplot2. Um, and if we go ahead and plot, Power BI actually takes this and does some really nice things to it. So if we go ahead and zoom in on this, this is the plot that we actually get. So all that effort and work lets us see this. Uh, Power BI will actually take this and make it interactive for you. If you're uh, deploying to another ecosystem like uh, WordPress or something like that, you'll have to use the second package as well and buy a license from a company called Plotly. But uh, Power BI will handle you know, making this so you can like, I'll show you what it does instead of just tell you. Um, but this is the first one and you get a chart that looks like this. It's kind of nice, it's fairly professional looking. Um, but we can see that the number one issue is disorderly and public, drug possession, battery. Actually, no, this one's not ordered yet. I did, the, this is the cheap one. Uh, I did everything better again to show. Uh, the difference when I'm, uh, when I'm doing charts, there's a professional chart that I give to like external that I publish, then there's an internal, like quick whip it up kind of chart. This is the quick whip it up kind of chart. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, you get a lot of options for coloring. Um, to kind of go through that really quickly, I use this library um, fairly frequently. This plus, this is another instance of, you're going to encounter this and once you exit the Microsoft ecosystem is that everything is done differently even though it's exactly the same thing. The plus is the same thing as the like percent piping thing. It's just this library wants to use a plus instead. So kind of get used to that. Um, this works off of what's called the grammar of graphics. Has anyone familiar read a book called The Grammar of Graphics? Know anything about the grammar of graphics? No? Uh, basically what it is is it's mappings, geometries, facets. You take all the different components that it takes to actually deliver a graphic and then break it down into a library that facilitates that. So the first thing that we'll see here is the aesthetic components or the mappings of uh, the month goes on the X and the count of the charge goes on the Y and the fill is another aesthetic component um, that is in indicative of what it is, how valuable it is. And then you add something like the geometries. Is it a line graph? Is it a bar graph? And you can actually stack these geometries on top of each other and create smooth versions of them. So like from a library perspective, for building charts, it's very nice and very effective because you can build very elegant stacked uh, charts that are highly complex, that display a lot of interesting information, and uh, very few lines of code. Uh, the next one is faceting. What this basically says is let's break the chart out into multiple other charts, and this one's going to do it by year. Uh, add titles and then fills, and then you get the final plot. The last kind of thing is if you pipe it into this ggplotly, so this is the plotly library, this gives you something that's way more awesome. 
except I got my alignments off a bit. This is kind of what, uh, what um, Power BI is going to do for you. So when, I'm, when you look at this chart, one of the big questions uh, that is going to come up is, it's kind of hard to segment out battery. What, what's the battery trend look like? Well, let's go ahead and just start filtering some of these guys out and hone in on just battery. So you get the ability to do this as well as let's hover over and see that we actually have 1,720 observations of battery in the month of July. So um, the nice difference between going from just static imagery to interactive is you can have a better conversation with whoever your stakeholder is. And the last kind of bit that I'm going to do is show how do you actually take this and turn it into a more professional chart. So one of the things that you need to do, um, and this gets to how all the libraries kind of work together, is that the, fact, the, the concept of a factor and the categories is, it all has this baked in concept of an order. So like how the months had an order that was baked in, every factor has an order to it. So the order that we saw over here on the right is because right now disorderly in public is number one, drug possession is number two, battery is number three, DUI is number four. If we use this factor and set the levels, the levels defines the order to the order that we did when we organized this into descending order. It now takes every item within the entire data set and assigns that behind the scenes ordering. So when you pair that with any library that comes with R, it's going to automatically organize it in that way for you. So one of the first things we'll do in any kind of ordered information is reset the visualization section of that slice into the proper ordering. And then we go through a whole bunch of other code that you guys are never going to remember after this. So I might just run it. Or um, if you're curious, I can explain. But mostly the big difference in this one is that I add a whole bunch of extra uh, code for defining themes and uh, adding in extra hoverovers to make it a more professional level graphic. So what we'll do at this point is execute all this code. Warnings don't matter. So you get a, lot, a significantly more professional looking um, chart. And the same kind of thing. So what we see now is before what we had on the chart was that there were so many months you couldn't really see what month there was. So you get the ability to really finely tune your legends. You can organize um, all of your charts by descending order. And also there's this thing called Brewer. I'll kind of point this out in the code. Uh, sometimes you don't know if your end customer is colorblind or um, if they have other kinds of disabilities. Uh, there's actually this Phil Brewer and palette, they have predefined palettes for people who are specific types of colorblind and specific types of um, seeing disabilities. And you can choose color palettes specifically for that. So that's really nice to have that out of the box. Um, and then the last bit is that you can do something like a plotly post if you enter your keys and get. I'll go ahead and find it on, the, on my uh, website. If you just search for jail, I've got an article, Miami Top 10 Jail Bookings. So this is a showcase of not only can you do this code and um, do it on your own workstation like you're used to doing, but you can also sit here and wait for the internet to uh, not actually do anything for you. So there's the static one. The first one is the interactive one that we're waiting for. Loading graph. And you can deliver it to a production WordPress. So, you know, I didn't really spend too much time on this. This one is data from May, but you get all the same interactivity that you wanted before with all the nice hoverovers, and you can start exploring 
in a deployed ecosystem. So that's really, really nice to be able to take a, a language that's geared for statisticians for this kind of work, for data manipulation, take some data that is absolutely atrociously formatted, and then at the end of the day, be able to deliver HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript to wherever you want fairly quickly. And the license fee, it, so that you get two options for delivering like this. You can either go Plotly um, or you can go Power BI with the Power BI embedded. So depending on your customers. The only things I would have to say are that Plotly has a, um, doesn't integrate into things like Active Directory and the authentication models aren't as good as Power BI. So I would probably start going for Power BI and then Plotly. Power BI can be a little difficult to get a hold of, so maybe if you're an individual, go Plotly. So that's kind of my advice on that. Um, I think at this point we've got nine minutes left, so I'm just going to open for questions. I've never done our programming in an hour before, so this is the first time it fit in this time frame. Yes? There are 40,000 packages on our uh, package distribution platform right now. Um, and R was built by st statisticians. Uh, so out of the box, there's some stuff like that. But then there's a variety of other packages that you can get for that. And literally, like, if you want to go find something, you go to imran.com. And then, uh, oh, come on. <laughs> imran.microsoft.com. Find an R package, significance, significance. Significance. I don't know how to spell significance. And hopefully the internet will load. You'll, we'll see whatever packages come up with keyword significance. You can also find uh, significance tests for canonical correlation analysis. You get like th thousands of things. I mean, you've got things like GPU computation. You've got things like uh, machine learning. There's all sort 40,000 packages primarily made by statisticians or like physicists or bio computational biologists. Those are kind of the primary users. But from our perspective, a lot of the problems in uh, data science and data manipulation are very similar. Like you get in a genome that has holes in it because your uh, processing and your chemical processing isn't perfect. Now you have to deal with that and figure out, well, how does this relate to this genome that we pulled from that guy over there? We have six genomes from the same guy maybe we can get some insight onto that. So they're doing very similar workloads with very large data. It's just instead of like, you know, how many sales this quarter did I make? It's how many instances of chromosome X in band Y or whatever. Other questions? Yeah. What was your conclusion? Was crime caused by all the There's not enough data to tell. There's, I mean, you can look at it uh, in here. I really, I, when I did this, I was like, oh man, there's not really that much data. You can see from May to uh, just past July. So I mean, we have the presence of a single season. And if we go to, um, it was like drug possession. Let's do drug possession and disorderly in public and see if we see seasonality there. Yeah, it looks like right around, uh, well, so July here, but then over here on March, July just finished up. So we didn't get a bunch on July this time around. So like. It looks like there might be some sort of wavy pattern, but I don't know what that wavy pattern is yet because we don't have enough information. I said we get together and we parse the data and make it look like the worst of the problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm good with that. Or it's <laughs> not have March of twenty fifteen, but aren't there a lot of events in March? Like specific events? I think there's a couple of uh on news festivals and stuff. Oh. Well so they just started collecting they started their data collection in May. Oh, this March of 2016, you said there was events? Oh. In 2016 of March, you know what's really funny is they did Ultra Music Festival. And uh, this is basically disorderly in public and drug possession. <laughs> so <laughs> if we just do drug possession, it looks like Ultra had a decent, you know, I'm just making stuff up. Ultra might not have actually did that, but when I think of people going to Ultra, that's what I think of. Uh, and there might be a reason for that. Disorderly and drug possession increased in Miami when Ultra was in town. Yeah, 
Yeah, every se it's on a seven month cycle. It's really just the speed, like the Python data manipulation and data frame libraries just are not as good as R. Even though R kind of crashes occasionally, and yeah, like you saw, like sometimes if the network hangs or there's like intermittent issues, you can have problems. But it's just like click and run again, where you can save states. Uh, Python doesn't encounter those same types of issues, but the libraries are a bit of a pain to work with. There's a lot more like finesse to making. Like the manipulation that we did in 230 lines of code of R, I don't even know where that would have been in Python. It would have been at least two or three times that. Uh, just because there's so much extra little finesse in every little thing that you have to do. Like just the ordering of the months in Python and getting it to display in order for this legend, that would have been at least another. We did it in one line, that probably would have been like 10 or 15 just because of the extra mapping and finesse that you have to put into it. Um, so that's kind of so like what, when I think about what I want to do, a lot of times what I'll do is I use a lot of Python for the GPU compute libraries that are available in Python, and R will do a lot of the prep to get the data into a format that now I can do GPU compute uh, because I find it a lot easier to get the data into that state with R because it's just quick, it's dirty. I mean, the language is super easy. I picked up R in like a week. Um, you just watch uh, a couple of videos. In fact, I have a couple of videos on uh, Channel 9. If you go look up Intro to R, I have four videos on there. After you watch those four videos, I go from like, I know nothing about R to you can do this kind of independently. And uh, after that, it's kind of like, do whatever you want. And you can, it's so easy to go back to and pick up again um, that it's kind of like one of those low barrier languages. So you use the R Studio here. Mm -hmm. Between our studio and the user studio integration with R? It dep well, for me, I'm doing Python and R, so I don't need Visual Studio for anything anymore uh, because I'm using those, those languages. Um, but if I was doing a lot of SQL, uh, C Sharp, and R, like I used to be doing, I actually use the R tools in Visual Studio a lot because I'm like, right click deploy database, I write some C Sharp code, I have my R code in the same spot, I organize some tasks to kind of move um, the R code into the C Sharp, and that kind of ecosystem was a lot more conducive for it, but because I'm not in that ecosystem as much anymore, uh, that's. Uh, that's why I'm doing the R Studio. So it depends on what you want to do. Yeah, I was thinking more like using C Sharp F Sharp for data prep. Then oh yeah, if you're doing C Sharp F Sharp, I would totally use Visual Studio uh, for, with the R stool, tools. Like literally, if you look at it, the R tools for Visual Studio looks exactly like this, just with the Visual Studio themes on it and all the nice right-click deploy stuff. Uh, so I'll still do like some SQL Server stuff, but a lot of what I'm doing is blob storage type stuff and da Azure Data Lake, and um, I'm just not finding myself doing those kinds of workloads purely because I'm doing a lot of GPU compute. Is it safe to assume that the three methods are there for other formats? CSV? Actually, so CSV, this read CSV can be like, uh, actually supports a variety, and there's actually a uh, thing where you do, so you can do comma sep equals backslash t and get tab. So if it's, if it's a separated file, um, CSV works for all separated files. And then you have things like JSON support as well, but that is a read.json or just a json.read. I forgot which one it was. There's a package called JSON Lite, and you just use JSON Lite's like read or whatever. Um, overall, I think the main lesson from this is it fits into uh, primarily data processing ETL manipulation and not necessarily into production workloads. Uh, so if you've got like 50 million terabytes and you need to operationalize the movement of that data, this is an awesome tool uh, for that. Um, okay, that's it, we're at 11 o'clock, so we're done. Peace. <laughs>